Hey guys, I'm Heidi Preeb. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome if this is your first time here. On this channel, we talk quite a bit about attachment theory and about any model that can help us understand ourselves and other people better, as well as how we can work with those models to get us more of what we want out of our lives and our relationships and less of what we don't want. So today I wanna to talk about a, not a model, but a term, a construct, that has gotten super popular in the past 10 years, which is the idea that vulnerability is incredibly important in fostering intimate, close, trusting relationships. Now off the bat, I wanna make it clear that I completely agree that vulnerability is a really important part of building trust and intimacy in relationships. But I think it's also possible for us to overdo vulnerability. So to be making ourselves too susceptible to harm in our relationships without doing enough self-protection. So this video is going to talk about how to find the center point between making ourselves vulnerable and kind of putting ourselves in other people's hands emotionally or practically speaking and showing up for ourselves and learning to be self-protective in situations that call for it. So I kind of look at the distinction here as secure vulnerability versus reckless vulnerability. Because the term itself, vulnerability, literally translates to being susceptible to harm or attack. And this is not meant to be the end goal in and of itself, right? When Brené Brown came out with all of her work on how vulnerability helps us foster intimate relationships and closeness, it was not the act of making oneself vulnerable to harm or attack that achieves that. It's what comes afterward. It's when we learn to put ourselves in situations where that opening up and connecting with another person is received in a way that is mutually let's say, vulnerable and connecting, and then it allows us to form those deep bonds. But it's not the act of vulnerability itself that achieves this end. It's what comes after. So sometimes when we practice vulnerability in the wrong scenarios, it's actually going to lead to negative results. It might lead to relationship ruptures. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how to recognize when it's safe to practice vulnerability when it's a good idea, and we're gonna start by looking at when it is not. So here are some of the signs that you might be overdoing vulnerability at the expense of your own self-protection, and we're gonna talk in each case about how we can start showing up differently. So sign one that you might be overdoing vulnerability is that when you get hurt in an interpersonal situation, you're not recovering in a reasonable time frame. So obviously there is no one way to tell what a reasonable time frame looks like when it comes to recovering from hurt or pain or breakups or whatever it is that has been painful for us interpersonally. But I think that a lot of us have a kind of gut instinct around times when we feel like we should be over something by now, but we're not. And a lot of the time, if the thing that we're having trouble getting over is a situation in which we made ourselves vulnerable, but did not receive the response that we wanted or maybe were hoping for, or maybe it was a relationship that we chronically made ourselves vulnerable within and we can't seem to move on. If this is the case for you, if you feel as though you have an abnormally difficult time moving on after showing your vulnerabilities, it's probable that you are outsourcing too much when you share yourself vulnerably. So what do I mean by that? It might mean that when you go into a situation where you're sharing yourself with someone, when you are trying to make yourself open and telling someone who you are, you are not just approaching the situation in the present, you are putting a lot of meaning onto it. So you might be telling yourself, I'm gonna open up to this person, and instead of just telling them the information I'm telling them and noticing how they respond to that, I'm going to tell myself this story around what it means about me as a person based on how they receive this information. So if I tell someone about something difficult I've been through and they don't seem to care or I feel like they're almost mocking me in response, if I've gone into that situation telling myself I'm going to determine my worth as a person based on how this person responds to me, that's going to take an incredibly long period of time to recover from because I've put so much weight 
onto that one interaction or onto a series of interactions with this person. If I was only looking to open up to them about one thing and they were to receive it badly and I didn't put any additional meaning onto them receiving it badly other than this person doesn't seem to be open to or interested in hearing about this particular thing I'm vulnerable about. It still might hurt or kind of sting if you get the reply that you weren't hoping for, but it's not going to absolutely crush you because you haven't built up this entire story in your head about what else it means. And this is something that people do a lot. It can be difficult not to make stories out of things, not to project the past onto our present. But it's just worth noting that if you feel as though when you're vulnerable and open with someone, if it doesn't go the way you want, it takes you a really abnormal length of time to recover from that, or maybe in some cases you feel like you never really recover from it, it's probable that what's happening is you are assigning too much meaning to your vulnerable shares and getting yourself stuck in a story that you can't work your way out of. So to combat this, you want to make sure that you are clear in your own mind about exactly what you're putting on the line when you're being vulnerable with someone. If you go up to someone you have romantic interest in and go, hey, I like you. How do you feel about me? And they tell you, oh, you know, I don't really feel that way about you. I'm not interested in you in that capacity. I think of you more as a friend. If you are looking at things from a secure perspective, you're going to go, okay, that's disappointing because I wanted something to happen with this person and now it's not going to happen. But if you are looking at this from an insecure perspective, if you are putting all of these stories and layers of interpretation on top of that interaction, now this person telling you they just think of you as a friend might mean something to you like, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm not attractive enough, I'm not intelligent enough, I'm not someone who's ever going to find a life partner. And those are really big, heavy, loaded stories that take a long time to recover from. So if this interaction is triggering those big, deep, old wounds, it's likely that the problem is you are assigning too much weight to the situations in which you're making yourself vulnerable. You're not just making yourself vulnerable to one rejection, you're making yourself vulnerable to a rejection of who you are as an entire person. And that is a huge thing to put on one interaction. So to combat this, what you need to do is make sure when you're going into a situation when you're going to be making yourself vulnerable, because it is an important part of life, you're getting clear in your own head about what it does and doesn't mean if the other person does not respond the way that you would hope. So picture it going wrong. Picture the other person rejecting you or saying something cruel to you. And then notice in your own mind before the interaction happens in real life, what stories come up when you imagine it going badly. And then make sure you're taking care to separate out those stories from the reality of the situation before you have the interaction in real life. And if you can't do that, which is also okay, maybe it's not time to have that interaction yet. If you're really unable to detangle the past and the present or your worth as a person from the way that someone responds to you in a single instance, it's okay to just recognize that and go, maybe right now, it's not the safest time for me to be practicing vulnerability interpersonally because when I do that, I tend to put too much of myself on the line. So maybe it's time to take a break, do some self-work, and figure out how you can separate those things out so that the next time you go into an interaction where you're choosing to be vulnerable, you are not looking at it as this kind of huge high-stakes life-or-death situation. You are just looking at it for what it is. Sign two that you might be overdoing vulnerability is that when you are vulnerable with someone, and this applies specifically to using vulnerability within established relationships, so whether that's a romantic relationship, a friendship, a family relationship, you find that it leads to an argument. So this is actually a really important one to pay attention to. If you make yourself vulnerable and someone doesn't respond in the way that you would hope, and you do not have the ability or understanding of how to protect yourself and comfort yourself around it going wrong, what's gonna happen is you're gonna become panicked the second you don't get the response you want, and you're going to try to elicit the response you want out of the other person by any means necessary. So you might try to shame them if you feel like they haven't been empathetic enough. 
you might try to attack their character, you might try to exaggerate and heighten what you were saying about your own vulnerability until you find something kind of extreme enough that they feel as though they have no choice but to respond in the way that you want. And all of those kind of tactics that might unconsciously come online are signs that you are going into situations where you are doing vulnerable self-sharing attached to the outcome rather than committed to the process. So when we are committed to the process of vulnerable sharing, we go, okay, I see a reason for myself to open up to someone. I see a reason why I want to share something with someone. But if they don't respond in a way that is conducive to the continuation of mutually vulnerable sharing, I'll stop. Because I know that for this process to work, if I'm trying to get close to someone or if I'm trying to expand my relationship with them, they have to be open to receiving what I want to share. And I have to be ready to protect myself if things don't go the way that I wanted them to. So a secure approach to vulnerability is going, okay, I think that there's a situation in my relationship that calls for me to be honest and show someone where I'm struggling or where my weak points are or share with someone some sort of thought process or emotional process that is incomplete at this point, which might feel a little bit scary or overwhelming for me to do. But if they don't respond well, if they shame me in response, if they are cruel to me in response, if they shut down in response and maybe need to take time to themselves to process, I have a backup plan for what I will do. I have friends I know I can go to, I have maybe a support worker, a therapist, or some other professional who I regularly meet with who I know I can approach with whatever type of emotion or maybe dysregulation that comes up in response to me feeling rejected. And I can find ways to soothe myself if this interaction does not go the way I wanted. I do not desperately need to try to continuously make the interaction go the way that I want. I have a plan B. The insecure response to getting rejected in the face of vulnerability is to panic and try to get the other person to behave the way they want them to. So to get better at practicing that type of secure vulnerability, try literally writing out a plan B for what you will do if you get rejected when you share yourself vulnerably or put down or otherwise have some sort of negative outcome. Figure out who will I go to? Maybe I have some friends who I can let know I'm going to do this vulnerable thing in my relationship. I'm going to open myself up in some way, and I'm not sure how it's going to go. If it goes badly, would you be available for a call tomorrow? Would you be available to hang out with me for the day on Thursday? Because I might need a little bit of co-regulation. Have a literal plan set up for what you will do if things don't turn out the way that you'd hoped. And that way you take the panic, the stress, and the charge out of each situation that you go into with vulnerability because you don't need a certain response from the other person. You will be okay either way. Sign number three that you might be overdoing vulnerability is that you tend to feel a lot of resentment in your day-to-day -day life and in your average experience of relationships, but you don't feel a lot of anger. So it took me a really long time to learn that anger and resentment are actually totally different things. Anger stems from a self-protective place. So when we are angry with someone else's behavior, it's our bodies and our minds telling ourselves, hey, it's time to set a boundary. I understand the way I don't want to be treated. I understand the types of situations I'm not willing to let myself interact with because it would be bad for me. And so I'm going to use my anger as a means of setting boundaries and making sure that I'm keeping myself okay within those boundaries. Resentment comes from a place of self-abandonment. When we resent someone, it means we don't make clear what we want, we don't set boundaries in place, and then getting angry at those people for not intuitively knowing what we want and setting our boundaries for us. And if we are projecting all of our boundaries outward and looking to other people to set them for us, we are making ourselves way too vulnerable, right? To think of our boundaries as things that exist within other people, so things that other people need to do, ways that other people ought to behave towards us so that we'll feel okay, that is putting ourselves in way, way too much harm's way. There are so many opportunities for that to go wrong, for us to be vulnerable to unnecessary harm or attack, for us to feel chronically victimized when other people put themselves first 
rather than us as they should, right? In any healthy relationship, both people are putting themselves first and then working together to figure out what goals they're going to accomplish as a duo. But if we are making everyone else responsible for setting our boundaries for us, we are going to feel chronically resentful when they're not doing it perfectly because nobody else could ever be perfectly attuned to us, nor would it be healthy for them to try to be. And so all of this resentment can build up when we are expecting other people to act in a way that keeps us okay. And when we are expecting other people to act in a way that keeps us okay, we are being way too vulnerable. And the antidote to this one is to use our anger to figure out where we're not showing up for ourselves, where we are not setting our own boundaries clearly enough, and then to make those boundaries explicit. A lot of the time when we go into interactions, thinking about how we're going to display ourselves as so hurt and vulnerable and wounded, what we're often neglecting is our own anger. We are mad that something happened. We are mad because there was a boundary cross that maybe we hadn't made explicit before, but somewhere within that vulnerability, there is usually a sense of neglected anger. And most of us tend to overdo one and underdo the other. So we either over rely on anger at the expense of vulnerability, or we over rely on vulnerability at the expense of anger. Anger shows us where we end and another person begins and vice versa. So if we are chronically using vulnerability and showing our partners or our parents or our friends how hurt and wounded we are, as a means of trying to get them to change their behavior, there is a high chance that what actually needs to happen is we need to get in touch with our anger, figure out where we are chronically not setting boundaries for ourselves, and then set those boundaries instead of trying to manipulate other people into setting them for us by acting chronically wounded. Sign number four that you might be overdoing vulnerability is that you chronically feel kind of crazy or out of control in romantic relationships or friendships or family relationships, essentially any close interconnected relationship. You might have this sense of the other person is way more in control than I am. And this is often a sign that we are not using discernment about who to be vulnerable with, right? Vulnerability across the board is not something we should practice. We do not live in a world where every single person is a good, safe person to be vulnerable with. So when secure people are forming relationships, what they're doing is noticing what happens when they are vulnerable. So if they share or disclose something that's a little bit vulnerable, and the other person is very receptive to that, and they're able to maybe respond in kind with something that's a little bit vulnerable about themselves, then a little bit of trust gets built. And then the next time they have an interaction with that person, maybe something a little bit more vulnerable gets shared. And maybe again, the other person responds in kind, or maybe it's a little bit more asynchronous. But in general, secure people are always kind of noticing and slowly building on situations where reciprocal vulnerability is happening. A big, big pattern I notice in insecure relationships is that those particularly who from those who are a bit more anxious will tend to be vulnerable with people who do not behave vulnerably in response and not think that that's a problem. What happens in that scenario is you begin to develop a vulnerability imbalance. So you have a relationship where you are extremely vulnerable to harm or attack and the other person is not because they are not making themselves vulnerable. And in such a situation, it can become borderline impossible for trust to develop because trust involves two people who are engaging with and investing in each other in equal measure. But if you are using self-disclosure over and over again in situations where someone is either not receptive to hearing and responding to it or where they are uninterested in sharing themselves vulnerably with you, you're gonna to start to feel that imbalance and it's gonna feel stressful. And if you were coming from a secure standpoint, you would note that imbalance and it doesn't mean the other person's a bad person. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It just means for whatever reason, they are either unwilling, unable, or uninterested in sharing vulnerably with you. And so that's probably not a safe person for you to be opening up to further. 
That doesn't mean you can't have a relationship with them. It just means your relationship with them might need to be a little bit more surface level. You might need to meet them where they're at, as opposed to trying to share over and over and over again and hoping that someday they will do the same in response. So in a healthy relationship, the vulnerability balance of the relationship should be approximately one to one. That's not always going to be the case and it's going to fluctuate based on life situations, of course, but overall, both people should be approximately equally vulnerable with each other. So just notice, if the ratio is more two to one for you, let's say every two times you open up to someone, they open up to you once. That's just worth noting, right? But if let's say every three times you open up to someone, they open up to you once, now you're kind of looking at an overall pattern of imbalance in the relationship. And if it's much more than that, you're gonna wanna really flag that in your head as someone who it might not be possible for you to build a healthy, trusting relationship with because you're just not on the same page about this thing. And again, that's okay. You just wanna make sure that you are showing up in a self-protective way for yourself and not putting yourself in a situation where you're chronically making yourself vulnerable to harm or attack when the other person is not doing the same. Ergo, trust can't be properly built. So this is all about learning to use discernment about who we get close to. And we're gonna have to note and be honest with ourselves in this process, if we tend to be very attracted to people who do not show vulnerability, that in and of itself is something that we need to work with inside of us, right? Because often, if we're attracted to people who show up as very invulnerable, who don't share much about themselves, what we're kind of unconsciously looking for if we really want to be close to that person is a parent figure. Parent figures when we're young, by nature of the role they're in, tend to hide their vulnerabilities from us as children because they're focused ideally on meeting our needs. And so when we grow up chronically kind of with that wound of I need to be reparented in some way, we might end up going for people or feeling very attracted to people who show no vulnerability. However, that is the beginning of an insecure relationship, not a secure one. Because if you're going in projecting that you want this person to take care of you and always be attentive to your needs and have no needs of their own, that's going to create a really unbalanced dynamic for both of you. So again, that's just something to note and be aware of if you notice that you actually get uncomfortable with a partner being vulnerable with you to the same extent that you're vulnerable to them, that's a sign that there's something you need to work out there, maybe in therapy or in support groups, around what types of people you're looking for and whether or not it's actually a secure adult-to-adult -adult dynamic that you're seeking out. And the last sign that you might be overdoing vulnerability, which we've already sort of covered in the previous points, but which I wanna make really explicit, is that you feel as though your vulnerability isn't working. So numerous times, mostly from those who are a bit more anxious, I've heard something along the lines of, I keep making myself vulnerable and it keeps not working. And I would like to contest that phrase slightly because if you have put yourself in a situation where you have made yourself susceptible to harm or attack, by definition of the word, you have succeeded in making yourself vulnerable. The other person does not have to respond a certain way for your act of vulnerability to be a success. If you opened yourself up to harm or attack, you have been vulnerable, it has been a success. Does this mean you should always do it? No, absolutely not, right? There are a lot of cases where vulnerability is not the appropriate choice. If I were to go out camping in a region where there's a whole bunch of grizzly bears and I leave my food lying around the campsite and then I pass out, I'm making myself incredibly vulnerable. I'm incredibly susceptible to harm or attack. But that doesn't mean that I should have done that. That doesn't mean my vulnerability is a good thing. But I have succeeded in making myself vulnerable, right? The only way to fail at vulnerability is to not do it, is to share something in a way that is dishonest or that doesn't genuinely open you up to true feedback. From another person. But often what I hear people implicitly saying when they're saying that their vulnerability doesn't work is that their vulnerability is not getting them close connected relationships, which is their secret end goal in being vulnerable. 
So they are looking at vulnerability as a means to an end rather than an end in itself. Now, this raises the question of why would vulnerability be an end in itself? And that is something that I think is incredibly important to explore. Why would we want to put ourselves in these situations where we're susceptible to harm or attack? There are some good reasons. One is because it's hard to learn anything in a state where we are not open to being wrong, where we are not open to having our minds or opinions changed. So vulnerability can be a wonderful learning tool in the right situations. Vulnerability can also help us align our inner and outer worlds. And a lot of the time, that can be a phenomenal end in and of itself. If I have been withholding something I really want to say, if I feel as though I am lying to or pretending around a certain person, and I just want to clear the air and let them know what my actual internal experience is without an attachment to how they will respond, that's a situation that's probably going to naturally result in me being a little bit more vulnerable. But the end goal there is to feel aligned internally and externally. So no matter how this person responds, no matter how they interpret it, even if they interpret it very negatively and have something very rejecting to say in response, I at least know that I have shown up for myself and been honest about what I'm thinking or feeling or experiencing. And now I don't have to feel like I am living this kind of double life anymore. Like I am saying one thing and feeling another. And that's the type of situation you wanna go into with a plan B established for what happens if you do get rejected or shamed or hurt in the process of being vulnerable. And so to combat that feeling of my vulnerability doesn't work, I would encourage you to get really in touch and specific with yourself about why you are being vulnerable in the first place. And if the answer is to elicit a certain reaction out of somebody, you are using vulnerability in a bit of a manipulative way, right? Instead of directly asking for what you want, you are trying to change the way the other person is feeling or thinking so that they give you what you want without having to ask for it. And if that is your secret end goal with sharing vulnerably, you are going to feel like your vulnerability doesn't work a lot of the time, right? Vulnerability is a great tool, but if you try to approach every situation with it, you're gonna end up in a lot of situations where you are using a hammer when you need a screwdriver. And you need to be able to use discernment to figure out which situation is which. When is it good for you to be open and vulnerable and share yourself with someone authentically versus when is it actually a better move for you to be self-protective, for you to reel it in a little bit, for you to learn to deal with whatever it is that you're feeling in a different way or with a different person. So the point of all of this is that vulnerability is not a bad thing. It's not something we need to do away with. It is a really important tool for building trust intimacy and closeness in relationships. We just need to make sure we are using it in the right way at the right times and for the right reasons. And this is an ongoing process of discernment that we will need to use pretty much daily in our close relationships, right? And it can just involve taking that pause and going, is this the right thing to do right now? And why am I doing it? And what will I do if it doesn't turn out the way that I hoped? That is how we go from practicing reckless vulnerability to secure vulnerability. And then ideally, all of our relationships get healthier as a result of us developing that discernment. All right, that is all that I have to say for today on this topic. As always, let me know what's coming up for you guys as you listen to this, what your thoughts, feelings, perspectives are in the comment section below. And until next time, I love you guys. I hope you're taking care of yourselves and your inner children and each other, and I will see you back here again super soon.